to Dielectric Videos. On today's video, I'm going to be doing a follow-up to my hoverboard teardown and maintenance video in which I discuss some tips on how to ride the hoverboard for beginners and for slightly more advanced users, and also some tips on how to stay safe when charging your hoverboard. Now the first thing I'm going to mention for those who are beginning or have never ridden one before is how to get on uh, most effectively. When you're getting on the hoverboard, you want to make sure that you line up the board such that it's not moving forward or backward under your foot. Now one of the most important things to realize about the mechanics of a hoverboard are that the forward and backward motor drive controls are directly controlled by the position of your foot on the rubber pad on top of your board. Now this rubber pad has two optical sensors under it that e uh, each control a respective direction of the motor on that side. Press it forward, the motor goes forward, press it backwards, the motor goes backwards. Now before you get on, try to get your board as centered as possible. Once you've gotten it centered, so it's not moving forward or backward, step onto the board as if it were a flight of stairs. Once you've stepped on like it's a flight of stairs, all you need to do at that point is come uh, to an equilibrium point of balance. Now while you're balancing your board, it's extremely important to make sure that you let the board do the work. If you don't let the board do the work, then you're going to start doing this, as you're, I'm sure you've seen a lot of people do when they first start riding. Now a lot of people who uh, initially start riding and uh, do this, they think they're trying to balance on a bicycle or a skateboard. What you want to realize is the motor has a tilt sensor built in to make sure that the balance is automatically kept controlled automatically. Now once you've gotten a pretty good uh, handle on how to keep the board steady and not have it move forward or backwards, the next thing you want to focus on is your stance. You want to have your feet as close to the edges, as close to the wheel wells as possible to make sure you have maximum contact area and maximum uh, controllability of the board. If your feet are near the center like this, well, I just switched it off by being too off the pads, but if your feet are too close to the center like this, it's really hard to steer it side to side uh, accurately. And if you're moving quickly, it's likely you'll tip one way or the other. The next thing you want to look at is how far forward your toes are. Now this varies from person to person. I like to keep my toes about two inches uh, further forward than the front of the hoverboard, but you can really put them at any position. Another thing people often ask is, does it matter whether I ride with the blue or colored lights forward or backwards? No, it really doesn't matter. I like to ride with the lights forward, especially at night, because it allows you to kind of see some of the bumps and obstacles in front of you before you run into them. But as I said, it doesn't really matter which way you ride it. Now, depending on what kind of hoverboard you have, your mileage may vary. I usually get about four miles to a charge on this. A really good high quality one would probably get closer to eight miles, and some of the very, very low end ones might get two miles. So it's important to make sure if you're going on an extended trip, you plan ahead and potentially bring backup power, such as the toolbox I mentioned in my Energize Toolbox video earlier. Now that I've discussed some of the basic elementary uh, steps to getting uh, on the hoverboard and riding the hoverboard, I'm going to move on to uh, a few things to know for more advanced riders, especially when you start riding fast and attempting to do tricks. So I've got the wide-angle lens attached to my phone now, and I'm going to be showing you a few more advanced techniques that you should probably know, uh, at least if you want to be able to ride most effectively. So the first thing I'd like to notify you of is how fast can you go? Well, let's listen for the telltale beeping. You hear that? That beeping indicates that you've reached the maximum tolerable speed for the system. Now, the system is active, and it completely relies on electronic circuitry controlling the motors to stabilize it. If you go too fast, and if you go about four miles per hour above that beep radius, which occurs at about six and a half miles per hour, the board is going to tip forward, and you're going to fly off, and it won't be very fun. So, if you start hearing that beep, it doesn't mean you necessarily have to slow down, but what it means is you need to start thinking about controlling your speed because if you keep accelerating, you're gonna crash. Now the next thing I think I'll discuss uh, is the issue of bumps. 
Now, the hoverboard itself is designed to be able to go over a bump up to and including the uh, lowest point under its chassis, which is about an inch and a quarter off the ground. Now, if you try to go over anything bigger than that, or if you try to ride one of these off-road, you're probably going to high center it. And if that happens, you'll probably fly off and scratch up the bottom. I know if you saw in my teardown video, the bottom of mine is already very scratched up. But you need to, uh, to be effective at going over bumps, you also need to be confident in your ability to go over them. If you see a big bump, maybe one inch, like a curve in the sidewalk, you're going to want to be very confident and push through it to go over it. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to effectively uh, manage that bump. Let me show you an example. Take for example, this bump in the sidewalk, which I will zoom down into right now. Now this bump right here is approximately one inch off the ground. If you hit that slowly, like I'm about to, you'll get stuck and won't be able to continue. Now the trick to tackling this bump effectively is going to be speed and confidence. You go right over it. Now let me show you from the ground level what you have to do to go over this bump. So you can see my hoverboard here. See I'm getting ready to approach. And I'm going to go at it with some speed. And went right over it. But if I go over it slowly, that happens. I'll go through, do a bit more riding, and if you're interested in going to the uh, safety and charging section, you can skip forward in the video, but otherwise it might be fun just to record a little bit of riding through a few different varieties of uh, landscape and terrain. So I'll get back to you in a few of the more interesting ones. Take for example gravel. Gravel is one of the hardest uh, surfaces to ride a hoverboard on effectively because it'll high center if it gets too deep. In this case, approaching very slowly and feeling for the wheels to start spinning is your best bet to not getting stuck in the gravel. Now if you spin too fast, you'll spin the wheels and lose traction and stability. But it can be done. You can ride in gravel. Many people think that concrete is a very easy surface on which to ride. But if there's a lot of cracks or bumps in the concrete, it can be quite difficult. It can actually result in, uh, over time, cumulative uh, wear on the wiring inside your board. Now, these boards are made to run over pretty substantial bumps. But if you're going over concrete for a long time, it is possible for damage to occur over time. Try to stay on surfaces of concrete that don't have bumps like this one. For example, the concrete just a few feet away. which only has a bump every eight or so feet. This is much better for the hoverboard and reduces the chances of wear on the inside uh, internals. Here's an example of a bump that your hoverboard most likely can't tackle. It's just over an inch and a quarter tall, and I'm going to attempt to jump over it. Likely this will not work effectively though because it'll likely bottom out against the board. Skilled riders may be able to tackle this with the right combination of momentum and lifting their weight off the board slightly. Now I'm going to flip the camera over so you can watch me approach. Hopefully I won't smash the camera up. Alright, let's see if I can do this. Well, that was actually quite lucky. I accomplished it and it worked. But don't count on that happening. It's quite possible you'll bottom out and run into something. One trick you can perform is rapid rotation. By applying a lot of force on the board in one direction, you can spin very quickly. You get dizzy after doing it though, so I don't recommend doing it uh, for too long. Another trick you can do, as you probably saw me do earlier, is you can sit on the board. As long as you keep your weight evenly distributed, you can ride around all day in a sitting position and won't cause any problems whatsoever. It can actually be kind of relaxing, but it can be quite hazardous because if you fall off in this position, you're much more likely to skate your knees. I'm doing a bit of fast riding now. You can see that my beeper is running. I'm pushing it a little bit hard, but 
I can feel my speed and I can approximate that I'm still well within the tolerable range of this machine's ability to compensate for speed changes. Thank you for watching my section on hoverboard uh, riding and basics and feel free to continue tuning in to listen to my section on hoverboard charging safety in the next part of this video. In this part of the video, I'm going to be discussing ways in which you can make the charging of your hoverboard or a hoverboard that you're using uh, safer and improve the likelihood of a situation being easier to control if uh, a problem arises in the charging process. Now, although very few hoverboards relative to the number charged have actually failed or caught fire, the Consumer Product Safety Commission has still issued a recall for these boards. Now, as a result of that, I'm not going to take any uh, liability or any responsibility for damage caused by you following any advice that I'm about to give. But nevertheless, I'm going to uh, tell you some tips that might uh, improve the likelihood of the charging system or the charging process being a bit safer and more reliable, and also to help you the life, uh, improve the lifespan of your battery in the long run. Now the first and arguably most important tip I'm going to give is stay in the general vicinity while you're charging your hoverboard. Uh, these chargers are simply 42 volt float chargers that just trickle current into the uh, battery pack until it reaches its maximum 42, or 42 volts. And if anything goes wrong with the charger or if the battery stays on the charger for too long and continues to trickle, you could potentially overcharge the battery. Now it even says in the manual, uh, in the user's guide for this hoverboard, to not leave the charger plugged in after it finishes charging. Try to unplug it within about 30 minutes of when the light changes from red to green on the charger. Now the other reason that you want to stay in the vicinity of the, of the charging area is if a thermal event does occur on the unlikely chance that it does and the battery starts smoking or catches fire, you want to be able to deal with the situation before any more property is damaged or any more hazardous material is released into the atmosphere. Now the gases from a lithium polymer battery fire are quite toxic and you don't want to stay, uh, you don't want to breathe these gases for any prolonged amount of time. So if by the time you've detected the fire, the room is already filled with, uh, with hazardous fumes, stay out of the area and call the fire department for your own safety. But if you think you can manage the situation and it's a relatively small, uh, a relatively small fire, be sure to know where your fire extinguisher is in your building. Now, if you don't have one of these, or if you don't know where it is, and you're going to be using hoverboards for uh, any amount of time, I strongly recommend getting a fire extinguisher. Uh, if, this, if there is a fire that's manageable, put it out, and then ventilate the area well to dissipate any of those hazardous gases. Now, another thing I should mention about these is it's, it's best practice not to allow them to charge when the battery is hot particularly after you've been using the hoverboard for very extreme riding, riding with lots of bumps, very steep hills, or just lots of fast riding. You want to give it some time to cool down before you plug the charger in to let it recharge. And the last thing that I should mention is just generally use common sense while you're charging these boards. If you smell anything burning, or if anything strange happens with the charger, any uh, arcing sounds or anything out of the ordinary, stop charging, take the hoverboard to some place where there aren't any flammables around, and then once it's stabilized, take it apart and look for damage to the battery to be sure that you're not going to be dealing with a potential fire hazard. Now, as I said, and as I mentioned, I'm not taking any responsibility for any injury or damage to property as a result of, these, uh, of using a hoverboard or charging it. These tips are certainly not an exhaustive list of ways to safely charge lithium batteries but it should potentially improve the likelihood of your hoverboard lasting longer and being less likely to cause a fire or problem in the future. Thank you for watching this episode of Dielectric Videos. I will see you next time.